All right. Hi, everyone. Good morning. Uh, I'm Dr. James Wu. I'm an endocrine surgeon from UCLA and really glad to be here at Thyka. And today, this morning, I'd like to talk to everyone about uh, tips on choosing a thyroid surgeon. And specifically, I want to help people understand the differences in thyroid surgeons' values and approaches and how we think about decision making to help patients participate more in shared decision making. So I think the first key is making sure that you choose a surgeon that is going to be safe. And, and what does that mean? Well, I think in the thyroid surgery, it's been really, really well established that your surgeon should do a minimum number of thyroid cases per year to have a lower rate of complications. And you can see in this paper by uh, Dr. Julianne Sosa, who's the chair of surgery at UCSF and an endocrine surgeon, they looked at this and found that 25 total thyroidectomies in one year was the critical number for a surgeon to perform to have a lower complication rate than people who did less. And it's also important to note that it's not about the number of years somebody has been in practice, but the number they do each and every year. Because if you stop or start doing less, you can fall out of practice. This is another study from the British Medical Journal. And you can see here that in this graph on the right, this is looking at the incidence of recurrent laryngeal nerve palsy. That means a temporary injury to the nerve that controls the vocal cord, which is a key part of thyroid surgery. And you can see that the more that a surgeon, uh, the more years that a person has been a surgeon, there's actually no change in the risk. It stays right around the same number. But if you look at the number of secondary hypoparathyroidism, when a parathyroid gets damaged, it, there is a correlation, but the peak is actually in the middle. So you want somebody who's not too young and hasn't been around too long. People who saw my talk yesterday may also recognize some of these slides showing that even for more advanced surgeries, doing neck dissections, that the same thing applies. You can see in the top study that if you need a central neck dissection or lateral neck dissection, which is needed when thyroid cancer spreads to lymph nodes, that a surgeon should do at least seven central neck dissections or a little over three lateral neck dissections each year to have better outcomes. Now that's per year, so it really does not have to be a high number, meaning that the vast majority of surgeons you meet will be safe. It's just important for you to ask to make sure that the surgeon that you've met is not unfamiliar with the operation. And finally, at the bottom, aside from just complications, cancer outcomes also change based on how many surgeries a surgeon does. And you can see that in this graph, the high volume surgeons are in the blue, the low volume surgeries are in the green. And this graph shows the percentage of patients that can live over time without a recurrence going up to 20 years. And you can see that all the blue patients are at the very top, meaning that high volume surgeons are better at removing all the disease and leaving nothing behind, lowering the chance of something growing back in that time frame. Another note that I... Uh, made yesterday that I want to reemphasize again, which is the importance of a surgeon performed ultrasound. So neck ultrasound is a key part of working up thyroid cancer and making sure that uh, we know what we're dealing with during surgery. And the ultrasound can be done by many people. It can be done by a, techn a technician and read by a radiologist. The radiologist can do it themselves. But nowadays, many surgeons will also have an ultrasound in their offices and do it themselves. And why does that make a difference? Well, in this paper, uh, all these patients had lymph nodes that the thyroid cancer had gone to in the side of the neck. And they looked to see in these patients who had a surgery to remove these nodes, who did the ultrasound? Was it a surgeon or a non-surgeon? And this showed that when the ultrasound was done by the surgeon, then there were zero recurrences during the study period. If this ultrasound was done by a non-surgeon, then that means that there was 14 recurrences or 12% of all those patients. Now, why would the ultrasound change how often disease recurrence happens? It's probably because when you have 
a very clear map of what's going on in the surgery, you tend to miss less of the nodes and leave less cancer behind. And one thing that patients may or may not be aware of is that there is a split amongst the specialties of who does thyroid cancer operations. And you have a choice. You have a choice between endocrine surgeons and a choice between otolaryngologists, who are also referred to as ENTs or head and neck surgeons. And I think both are good surgeons, both are, have great training. They just differ slightly. And to help you understand some of those differences, an endocrine surgeon is usually a surgeon that has gone through general surgery training and then done a one or two year fellowship in endocrine surgery. And those surgeons tend to specialize in thyroid, parathyroid, or adrenal care. Otolaryngologists uh, learn thyroid and parathyroid as part of their residency training. And while some choose to do an additional year, it is more optional because they've already had a lot of experience in thyroid and parathyroid operations. I think that there is no clear best answer. I think that both websites, endocrinesurgery.org and HANS info slash endocrine, both have find a surgeon services. So if you want to find a surgeon that's part of these societies, you can look at these websites. And again, what I highlighted earlier is, you know, either way, you want to ask how many of these operations do you do per year? Because at some institutions, it's all endocrine surgeons and other institutions, it's all otolaryngologists. And there's going to be probably a few surgeons that do the most. So we just talked about what keeps you safe, which is choosing a surgeon that does a adequate number of cases per year with that number being relatively low and having a surgeon that will do their own neck ultrasounds to have a good map of the surgery before doing so. So the rest of this talk, which is the vast majority, is more about values and decision-making. Because even though there are many, many surgeons that are going to be safe, you want to choose a surgeon that asks you what your preferences and values are, that their approach aligns with your values, because there's a wide spectrum of difference. And let's go through it. So I know this is a thyroid cancer association, but this first example is about appendicitis. And the reason why I chose this is because this is uh, the first piece of work that started off this lane of research and inquiry. And appendicitis is very straightforward. You go to the emergency room, you have appendicitis, typically a surgeon will operate on you. Well, uh, so surgeons in the American College of Surgeons were given this scenario on paper, a 19 year old uh, girl goes to the emergency room has pain for three days, gets a CT scan. CT scan shows appendicitis without an abscess, but it's perforated. And what do you do about it? And surgeons, we just have to make one choice. We have to choose to offer an operation, an appendectomy, or we choose to not uh, operate right now and treat with antibiotics. And in this survey, and you can see the reference below, Greg Sachs, the first author, is one of my co-residents. You can see that uh, surgeons were actually split 50-50, where 50% said they were either very unlikely or unlikely to offer an operation, and the other half are likely or very likely to offer one. And uh, you know, for those of you who are watching, I can tell you that the teaching from the American College of Surgeons and Surgery Training is that usually when there's a perforation without abscess, making a phlegmon, you actually don't operate. So we're actually surprised to see the number of people who choose to offer an operation. But we wanted to look more into this because if you're a patient who goes to an ED, it's almost like a coin flip, which surgeon you meet, and they will choose one or the other, operate or not operate. And I wonder what the right answer is. So one thing that we looked at is, are people deciding to operate or not operate because they look at the operative risk differently? And here is a graph of all the people who respond to the survey. And you can see it's hundreds of people. And hundreds of surgeons responding to the survey and their estimates of how risky is this appendicitis operation goes between zero and 100. And sure, a lot of it are clustered around zero, but depending on who you meet, they may have a very different idea about the risk of this operation. And of course, it's not just about the risk of operating. There's also a risk of not operating. And you can see that we, there's even less agreement about what are the risks if we decided not to operate on this young woman. 
Now, what is the truth? Well, that's hard to get to because you have to look at a lot of studies. So this is one paper looking at what happens if you do a surgery versus just give antibiotics when there's appendicitis and a phlegmon. And I've distilled all this random numbers into this graph and I just put a box around it. So you can see that you know we're pretty good at estimating what the true operative risk is. Of course, as surgeons, we tend to think it's less than what the average is. Uh, but the non-operative risk, we also think that it's probably higher than what it really is because we overestimate the risk of not doing something. Uh, one quick aside is that there was one randomized control trial. We consider this to be the best evidence for doing things or not doing things. And I just want to show you how easily we can interpret the same data in different ways. So in this study, they took these patients who had the same problem and they did surgery on half and the other half, they didn't do surgery. This is the half they did do surgery on. And if you look at the little exclamation marks, when they chose to do a surgery in two patients, they had a bowel injury. They weren't supposed to injure the small bowel, but they did by accident. In four of the surgeries, they didn't find the appendix. And then finally, in a few more, they had an abscess that formed afterwards anyway. And when you add up those, about 26% of patients had a bad outcome after surgery. If you look at the patients at the bottom who underwent no surgery, of course, nobody had their bowels injured because they didn't have an operation, but a few patients after they went home came back because they still had pain. And some of those had operations with one of those operations resulting in a bladder injury. And so I added those numbers up and 13%. And so I said, well, when I, when I look at this data, it seems pretty clear that we should probably just wait because operating right away has risks. But then when you look at what the authors wrote from the study, they said that they concluded that doing surgery is safe and feasible. And this was preferred because more patients after they left the hospital had an uneventful recovery uh, when you did a surgery up front versus just watching it because many of those patients end up coming back. So it's a real difference in values. Clearly, the authors in this study said once the patient leaves, we don't want them to have further episodes and come back. But I would think that if I was a patient, I would want to have a lesser risk of bowel injury. And so you can see that even looking at the same numbers, we can think of it different ways. And so finally, does a surgeon's behavior, is it dictated by how they see risk? And the answer is just kind of that you can see on the far left in the first column, if you have a surgeon that thinks that the surgery is not very risky, how likely were they to recommend surgery? Well, 75% said, yeah, let's do the surgery. But a quarter of them still said, no, we shouldn't, even though they thought the risk of surgery was low. And you can see across, there's not agreement with just 50-50 in the middle. So clearly, just how we see risk is not the sole way that we make decisions. So looking into this in decision science, what we thought of how people make decisions was something called normative decision theory. It sounds very fancy, but all it really means is that when we make decisions, we are fully rational, we make ideal decisions, we weigh what's good, what's bad, and we pick the better number. But clearly from these studies, it's, that's not true. Okay, so all that same technique, same method, same ideas, I just wanna apply it to thyroid cancer. Um, in order to have this discussion, I think it's important to have a quick three-minute overview of just what is the process of treating thyroid cancer. And so uh, real briefly, whenever somebody comes to see us and they have a new nodule and we're concerned about it, it goes through these steps. Number one is to check a thyroid ultrasound. And using that ultrasound, we'll assign each nodule a score using these scoring systems called TIRADS and ATA for American Thyroid Association. Now, based on that score, we can either say this looks pretty benign, or if the score is high, we think that it's suspicious for a malignancy. And then we move on to the next step, which is doing an FNA, which is fine needle aspiration, which is how we biopsy thyroid nodules. That biopsy sucks out a few cells that we look at it on a slide. You can see a picture of cells on a slide at the bottom, and those get scored one through six. And two is benign, six is this is cancerous. And in the middle, there are some categories where we're just not sure. And those patients will get molecular testing.
once you identify a cancer, either by it being Bethesda 6 or by molecular testing, then what do we do? Well, the first thing is usually offer patients a surgery. And the American Thyroid Association has these guidelines about how we perform surgery. Choices being total thyroidectomy to remove all of the thyroid or thyroid lobectomy and just removing half. If the nodule is really large, more than four centimeters, or there's evidence that the cancer has gone into the lymph nodes or somewhere outside the thyroid, then the choice is clear to do a total thyroidectomy. When it's under one centimeter, the general guidance is to do a thyroid lobectomy. And even for the American Thyroid Association, there is a lot of gray for everything in between, which is most patients. When it's one to four centimeters, they say that thyroid lobectomy alone may be good enough, but the treatment team can choose to do a total instead because they want to enable REI therapy or if they want to enhance follow-up. And at the bottom, and or patient preferences, which I think should probably be you know, top of the list rather than the other things. So after surgery, we have to decide whether or not we give radioactive iodine ablation. Do we remove the rest of the thyroid tissue and microscopic stuff with radioactive iodine? And that should reduce recurrence risk, but the uh, evidence has shown it only works for ATA high-risk patients. How do we know what somebody's risk is? How do we assign that? Well, it's this chart that many people may be familiar with from the American Thyroid Association. And based on how large the tumor is, how many lymph nodes are involved, we assign risk. And what we could say confidently is that everything below the bottom red line, those are low risk. And a big paper came out just recently in the New England Journal of Medicine showing that in patients with low risk thyroid cancer, there's absolutely no difference in outcomes once you get radioactive iodine. So I think that is very clear evidence that everyone on the bottom does not need radioactive iodine. It only adds complications without providing benefit. For everybody above the second red line, it absolutely does help. And in between, which is a narrow band of patients, uh, it can be selective because we're just not sure. Choosing between a total thyroidectomy and a thyroid lobectomy, some patients may ask, uh, what, what is the big deal? Why do we care so much about it? Um, because a lot of surgeons have done total thyroidectomies for a long time, and they can do it with a relatively low risk. But there is still a difference. When you do a total thyroidectomy or a thyroid lobectomy, let's start there, that there is a 5% risk of temporarily injuring that recurrent laryngeal nerve resulting in hoarseness of voice, a 0.5% risk of a permanent recurrent laryngeal nerve injury, and then there's a 0% risk of damaging all the parathyroids because we have four parathyroids and you're obviously going to leave two good ones on the other side. There's going to be a 14 to 60% risk of hypothyroidism or having too little thyroid hormone because the normal half will still make hormone, but for, mo but for some patients, that's not enough and they need to take extra hormone to have enough for their bodies. And so compare that to total thyroidectomy where of course, if we remove all of it, 100% of those people are going to be hypothyroid. And then finally, if you remove half, eventually some of those patients will realize after the fact that they actually do need a total thyroidectomy. And so that does carry a risk of needing a second operation. But compared to that, if you do a total thyroidectomy, of course, there's going to be double the risk of nerve injury. And that's purely because there's a left and a right nerve. And because you're operating on two nerves instead of one, the risk of nerve injury is a little higher. There's that one to 3% chance of low calcium if you damage all the parathyroids. Even though low calcium sounds very benign, for some patients who have it the worst, it is truly debilitating where they're taking like upwards of 20 tablets of Tums each day. They still get symptoms, numbness and tingling in the hands and feet and face. So uh, that is something that we should also take seriously. And I think it's worthwhile zooming out to the big picture for surgeons and to help patients understand why some surgeons, including myself, really try to push for sometimes less treatment than more. Uh, and I wanna try to illustrate some of these uh, things to help patients understand why that would be. Because if we look across the landscape that thyroid cancer, that there's a huge number of overdiagnosis and overtreatment. 
And I, while I do think that there is actually also a true rise in the number of thyroid cancers are happening, it's mixed in there with a lot of thyroid cancers that simply did exist before and are getting found. And this is the evidence for that, that so we thought that this could be happening. We didn't know exactly how to prove that it was happening. And so we devised, not we, but they devised a study where they looked at patients who died of other causes, non-thyroid causes, heart attacks, um, hit by a bus, you know, anything that was not thyroid related. And they removed those patients' thyroid glands and autopsy and looked for, do these patients have thyroid cancer? And these numbers are percentages. So if you look across this graph, 11%, 12%, 12%, 13%, these are the percentages of, thi of thyroids that had thyroid cancer. And so in a classroom of 100 people, 10 people sitting in that classroom have a small thyroid cancer. And you can see here, it's not a function of age because that's what we used to believe that we thought maybe you just get older and you get a small one. But in the one that I circled, these are people who are aged less than 40. So under 40 years of age, you look through their thyroid, there's going to be a small thyroid cancer. That's not meant to be a scary statistic. It's meant to really illustrate that thyroid cancer is one of these things that it happens in many people. And many, many people, it sits there and it does nothing. And others, uh, as this organization knows, it can grow and become more life-threatening and become harmful. And the key for surgeons is to carefully sort through which one and not indiscriminately treat all of them the same. And finally, in the ones that I underlined that this study was done across eight countries across four continents. So it really is a worldwide phenomenon. And this is just showing again that the number of thyroid cancer cases are going up. And this is talking about mortality. How many people die from their thyroid cancer each year? And even that number is going either the same or slightly increasing from 1990s to 2010. So even though we are doing a much better job with neck ultrasound, detecting thyroid cancers, finding them, this graph at the bottom shows we are doing more thyroid operations than ever. In 2009 and NISQIP, they filed that we were doing 500 thyroidectomies approximately per quarter. In 2017, that's risen to the nearly 1,500. We're doing more thyroid surgeries than ever, and yet the mortality is not going down. And that can mean a couple of things. One, it could mean that we're finding and treating a lot of thyroid cancers that don't ultimately dictate how long a person lives. And the other thing is that we are not advancing the field in the right ways that will reduce the overall mortality of all the people who and have died from their thyroid cancer from the 90s up till this point. And I think that for patients, it's important to understand that as the thyroid surgeons, we all understand these numbers. I think these are widely accepted. And that's why we think that there's this need to calm down and not treat every single thing we find, given how big the reservoir is of thyroid cancers that don't matter. Because all surgeons and patients are faced with this dilemma, the trolley dilemma, where you can choose to do after surveillance or less surgery, thyroid lobectomy over total thyroidectomy. And I know that people always have a concern that, well, does this mean my cancer has a bigger chance of growing back or getting worse? But uh, those chances are low and mortality risks from these things are low. And when we overreact, we do too much surgery, we overtreat, we end up causing more nerve injuries, we cause more damage to the parathyroid glands, and for many patients, we cause more financial toxicity. We rack on medical bills when we do things we don't need to. And that also has a big impact on patients' lives. Again, this is a summary of the problem that is such a huge reservoir of thyroid cancer, 11% in the general population, that we're doing more operations than ever, but not getting the results we want, which is decreased mortality rate over time. And so... I wanted to investigate then, you know, how do we actually change this? Because this is not a technology change. We have all the technology we need. We uh, have the expertise to do the surgeries. It all comes down to how we make decisions and how we do that with patients. So these are a the couple of the studies that uh, we've done. This is just Max Schum. He's one of my residents. He's becoming an endocrine surgeon. He helped me work on these. So what we did is just like uh, in the slides I showed about appendicitis, we did the SAC 
same type of a study where I put up this slide. I gave this to American Thyroid Association members. So these are members of the community who are our physicians, and they are self-declared as being very interested in thyroid. And most of them treat thyroid cancer, majority of their practice. So let's say in this scenario, I offered them a 48-year-old woman who found a neck mass that was two centimeters. Nothing was suspicious in the ultrasound except for this nodule itself. I try to emphasize that. And the patient is healthy, normal thyroid status, asymptomatic gets a biopsy, shows that it's papillary thyroid cancer. And then I asked all the people who responded to the survey, what would you do? And I categorized them into choosing either thyroid lobectomy, removing half, or removing the whole thing. And this was a mix of endocrinologists and surgeons, but uh, uh, so there's both medical and surgical opinions in this. This is the result. The result was, is that out of these uh, 200 members of the American Thyroid Association that about 66% said, in this scenario, I would tell the patient, I think you should get a thyroid lobectomy. Another third said, I think you should get a total thyroidectomy. This means that if you're a patient and you don't know, you know what the endocrinologist or endocrine surgeon's values are, and you just go see one. If you see three, two of them will agree, one will disagree, and you'll get different opinions on what to do. And if you only see one, it's really just a one in three chance they'll tell you to go to total. And just to kind of set the context before the next few slides, I just want to show what we understand, because this, again, is from the American Thyroid Association, very well accepted slide about the risk of disease recurrence. And for an intrathyroidal, less than four centimeter uh, papillary thyroid cancer, the risk of recurrence is one to 2%, two to four centimeters is 5%, so it's right in between there, somewhere between two and 5%. So I asked them, okay, so you've told me what you want to do. I want you to tell me if I chose A or B, then what is the risk that something will grow back after treatment? And you can see in the arrow that when, they, when I asked them, if you did a total thyroidectomy and you did radioactive iodine, what do you think the risk of recurrence is? And you can see that they thought it was pretty low, uh, centered around 0%, but some thought it was a little bit higher. On the first graph, it's what is the probability if we didn't do the most aggressive thing? What if we just did the less aggressive thing and just did a thyroid lobectomy? You can see the tails start to trend up where 38 patients estimated between 10 and 20% and then a small, a small minority, but you know, a good like 18 uh, more people said between 20 and 60. And of course, we just looked at those numbers, which would be two and five. So the numbers already start to not to add up exactly. And so this third graph is simply the difference between the two. So for in any one individual, they're gonna hold in their mind one number. This is what the risk is if I do the most. This is the risk if I do the least. And what is the difference between that number? Because if they perceive a big difference, then they're gonna choose the more aggressive. If they perceive no difference, then you would think that they would choose the less aggressive option because it carries less operative risk. So this is that difference on one side to the left. You would imagine logically, that individual would choose a lobectomy. On, on the right, they would choose a total thyroidectomy. Um, and you know it's not true, it's not true. Uh, so when I looked at the differences and how they re estimated risk, if you're there on the top side, if they think that doing a total thyroidectomy will reduce somebody's risk by 20% or even 40%, what is the number of those physicians that recommend a total thyroidectomy? 39%, not even all of them. When I look at the other end of the spectrum, people who said there's really no difference between these two uh, operations for the patient, 28% of those patient uh, surgeons and uh, endocrinologists still recommended getting a total thyroidectomy, even when they thought from a cancer standpoint made no difference. And what do, pa and what do patients want and what do patients accept? Now, of course, it, this is all very individual, but as a whole, this is experiment uh, done by uh, Dr. Julianne Sosa. And they asked patients, you know, either or questions. Would you rather get a higher risk of cancer occurrence or would you rather have a, a higher risk of having low calcium? And in this survey, patients said that I would take a 1.6 increased risk of thyroid cancer growing back if you could guarantee me 
that my risk of getting low calcium could be zero. And that difference is the difference between a total thyroidectomy and a thyroid lobectomy. So most patients would say, I would take a thyroid lobectomy, even if that increased my risk 1.6%, which totally falls in line with what we understand. And, low, and below that is what about the risk of having a nerve injury causing a voice change? And patients would take a 2.6% increase in risk of thyroid cancer if we could lower the risk of hoarseness from 8 to 1%. And, you know, are we doing a good job of shared decision making? This is a, a study by Dr. Megan Haymar. She's a very famous endocrinologist from Michigan. And she, uh, went through these registries of patients who've been treated. She actually contacted them and asked them about their experiences. And you can see that in all these patients that received radioactive iodine, that 85% of them reported they felt like they had no choice in the matter, that they were just told they should get it, and they just went ahead and got it. I'm just going to do one more scenario. Uh, this scenario is about papillary thyroid microcarcinoma. So it's a 62-year-old woman and the woman is also healthy, euthyroid, no symptoms. And this is a 0.8 centimeter thyroid cancer, biopsy proven. And in this case, I was really trying to test the, the waters about feelings about active surveillance. So if they recommended active surveillance, I put them on one side. If they, were, if they recommended any surgery, whether it's a thyroid lobectomy or total, I put them on the more aggressive side. So it was a dichotomous choice. This is the results. And you can see that about 35% of ATA members said, yeah, this is a reasonable choice. Um, I would recommend that they do active surveillance. On the other hand, there are you know, a good two thirds that recommend some type of surgery with a very small minority recommending total thyroidectomy, which is actually not what the ATA recommends. So what do patients want? Well, uh, this is a paper by Dr. Anna Saka. She uh, is actually the editor-in-chief of the journal Thyroid. And uh, she actually gave patients who were eligible all the information she could about active surveillance who had micro PTCs, papillary thyroid cancers. And based on the information that they reviewed and looked at, 71 of those patients chose active surveillance and only 29 chose to have an immediate surgery. So this shows us that when we gave patients the room and the space to make their own decisions with all the information that we know currently, most of them chose to have active surveillance. But what happens when we leave it in the hands of physicians and surgeons? Well, if you look at this uh, survey of physicians about do we offer after surveillance? And of all the physicians that responded that say, I don't do this, and they were asked the reasons why, the top reason was the patient doesn't want it. And so they think this shows that there's a fundamental disconnect between what we as physicians can sometimes assume the patient wants versus what a patient would actually choose given the space, given the information. And you can see here on the right that um, there are many factors that go into what we decide to do that don't have anything to do with the patient themselves. Um, if you look at the bottom quote, on the right, it says, the reason why we don't do active surveillance is we don't have enough endocrinologists as it is. My clinic is booked six months. We don't have the human resources to support this thing. So inevitably, they're making a decision which is about resource allocation, about what they think they can manage, and not about what they think is going to be good for an individual patient's risk and benefit. What is the truth about active surveillance? Well, the, the data is still coming in, but this is what we understand so far. On the left is a graph from Memorial Sloan Kettering's first experience with over 200 patients. Each line in that graph is an individual patient with undergoing active surveillance. And if the line is going up, it means that the cancer is growing. If it's going down, it means the tumor is shrinking. You can see that for the dark green, the vast majority of these tumors over this study period actually didn't change in size very much. There's a small fraction on one end, about 12% that increased and needed surgery, and also about 12% on the far other end that got smaller. Is this safe to do? This all started in Japan with the long experience, and they've reported after 10 years that none of the patients enrolled in active surveillance developed a distant metastasis. And in terms of nodal metastasis, only 0.5% of the patients who are undergoing surveillance 
develop that problem at traveling to a lymph node. And even if you did the most, which is surgery right now, is that protective? Is that make it zero? It doesn't, it makes it 0.2. So it leads to a 0.3% difference. This is the most recent update of that. Um, and my other slide is a little bit older. This, they just released their 30 year experience. After 30 years, you can see on this graph that it does start to separate a little bit more at 20 years, where in the active surveillance, AS, 1.7% had a lymph node metastasis. In IS, immediate surgery, 0.7%. That means in this scenario, the 62 year old woman would now be 82. And if you gave 100 of those 82 year olds active surveillance, two of them would have developed a lymph node med, uh, which I think is pretty uh, good odds. And then for distant metastasis, they did occur after a while, but they happened in both arms equally, one in active surveillance and one in immediate surgery, and both patients are alive. So it wasn't life-threatening in this experience. And so far, none, nobody in the experience has died from their thyroid cancer. Okay, let's go back to what the ATA members thought. So I asked them, what do you think is the risk of metastasis if you did a thyroidectomy? Well, of course, they all said uh, nothing. It's zero. It's totally, we take care of the problem. And what happens if we do it with active surveillance? Uh, they saw the data that I'm showing you, and there's still this big misunderstanding about what the actual risk is. Some of them estimating it upwards of 20%. Same thing as I showed you before. So there's going to be physicians on both sides, surgeons that perceive a tremendous amount of risk, surgeons that perceive no risk. In the patients that, in the surgeons, uh, sorry, physicians that perceive the most risk, 30% of them are still willing to offer active surveillance. 71% said surgery. And in the group that perceived no difference in risk, half of them said, still, just get a surgery because I don't think active surveillance is a good idea for you. So all of that research just gave me one number, which is how much of a physician's decision-making is actually correlated to differences in what they actually report in terms of how they see risk. It's 11%. What is the other 90%? It's how they were trained, what their colleagues do, what they think is expected of them, what their regional resources are, what their logistics are. So there's so much that goes into how a physician gives you a final recommendation that has nothing to do with what they think the risk and benefits are of the different treatment options. And again, that means that numbers and data, small part of the story, we're not robots. We don't do these complex calculations in our minds. We still operate just like everybody else with assumptions and biases and norms. So how do we, how do we improve that? Because it's really... Now that we understand the problem, it's a little bit hard to untangle it. And there have been several things that have been proposed. Here's one that my colleague tried. He said, well, and this includes is where the appendicitis story came from, that NISCOP has a risk calculator. Why don't we just have a website and physicians can go on the website, punch the numbers, and it just shows them a number. This is the risk. And so you can see that the gray is the no risk calculator and the empty boxes are the risk calculator. So if you show a surgeon the actual risk based on real data, you can see that the numbers start to go towards the red line. You actually start to correct a surgeon's mindset, and they will answer correctly when you ask them, well, what do you think the real risk is now? But, you know, does it change what they do? It doesn't. So... On one side, the gray line is the people who did not see the risk calculator. On the black is the surgeons that saw the risk calculator. Nobody did anything different. And they even answered different levels of risk. So you actually educated the surgeon. You taught them a new number. But at the end of the day, when they were asked to make a decision for recommendation, they did the exact same thing. So clearly just that is not enough. Even among thyroid surgeons, there's a lot of thyroid surgeons, we argue all the time about whether or not we should give antibiotics before the surgery. If we give antibiotics before the surgery, the idea is this is going to decrease the risk of skin infections. What is the downside? Well, the downside is you could give some patients C. diff, that's really rare, and you could also cause antibiotic resistance. So we shouldn't just give it to anybody willy-nilly. So what is the evidence? The evidence is 
in a randomized controlled trial, a thousand patients in both arms, one half getting antibiotics, the other half not, the rate of surgical site infection for thyroid surgery and parathyroid surgery, no difference, does not make a change. We look at this and we say, what do we do? American Association of Endocrine Surgeons releases a recommendation. And you know these are big names. If you look on this list, a lot of these are chairs of departments. They run big institutions, Nancy Perry, MD Anderson, Ralph Dufano at Hopkins, uh, Julian Sosa at UCSF. These are, this is everybody. Uh, Jared Doherty, MGH. Recommendation 19, antibiotic prophylaxis, not necessary before thyroid surgery. But what do we do? This is a survey of American surgeons. Quan Du is a very famous, Orlo Clark, very famous surgeon at UCSF. You know, you, it's so split where 60% of surgeons say, I never give antibiotics before surgery. And a third say, we almost always give it. So even with the best recommendations, with very clearly worded recommendations from all the leaders in the field, people end up just doing things. So I think that how do we fix this in our little bubble of thyroid cancer decision-making? I think there's a different approach we can take. And the pathway out is shared decision-making, having patients communicate very clearly what their preferences and values are. Because in this uh, study that we published in JAMA Surgery, we asked in all these things, at the end of the day, if the patient themselves requests, I know you recommended that I get a thyroid lobectomy, I want a total or vice versa. You told me to get a total, but I want a thyroid lobectomy. You can see on the right, all these dots, the physicians will comply with the patient request. And what we want to look at was, is it a difference in the level of risk where if a physician thought it was going to be too risky to uh, let patients choose, they would refuse? It's not true. They will let patients choose the therapy of their choice regardless where they sit along this axis of risk. And for the few physicians that say, no, I will not, I want you to do what I'm telling you to do, you can see that their estimates of risk are still all spread out among the difference between aggressive and not aggressive treatment. So if you see a physician, you tell them, I know what you just told me, but I've looked into it and I don't want that treatment, I want option B, and they say no, they're not doing it because they are staunchly thinking that they're protecting you from something or about their risk estimates. Uh, they simply, that's their personality. And if you go to somebody else, most likely other physicians will. So how am I going to look into this? Uh, there's another thing of looking at ethnographic decision modeling, because instead of studying what physicians think about what they do, because we've clearly shown that it's really hard to change their mindset. I think the better thing to do is help patients have a framework of communicating their preferences and values so that they can just tell their individual providers what exactly their goals are and help work together towards the treatment that works for them. And so in this uh, methods, it requires going into the culture, learning a lot of context, understanding what are the different things that go into decision-making. This is done in phases. Um, this is a kind of technical uh, construction of a research study. But the first thing is to do these semi-structured interviews, really talk to all the individual, the stakeholders, and figure out what drives the decision-making. Um, this is a selfish little plug, but you may notice that uh, there are some flyers around this area. Uh, this is a study that we're doing right now. Uh, we actually received some research funding from the ATA to do so. And so um, hopefully we'll work with FICA members, uh, talk to many more patients who have undergone treatment for thyroid cancer so that we can kind of better understand uh, how patients make decisions about their thyroid cancer and not only how they make it, but which decisions actually lead to high satisfaction and low regret and which uh, decisions lead to uh, the opposite. So we can tell patients, I know that this is your bias and this is what you would choose in the situation, but that may lead to a lot of regret down the line. So this is the end of the talk. This is a quick summary that, you know, again, surgeons and endocrinologists are, are human. We're very vulnerable to our biases, but at the, the best part is, is that we're very open to patient preferences. 
So it's important to engage in shared decision-making and really communicate that high volume surgeons do have lower complications. So when choosing a thyroid surgeon, you really want to assess how many of that operation doing each year with the number being not that high, 25 thyroidectomies. And we really have to begin to understand uh, how patients have different contexts and priorities in order to choose the best thing for them. Uh, thanks for all the attention. Uh, my email is here if there's any questions or if you want these slides. Uh, and these are uh, uh, all the members of the team that have been helping me do a lot of this work. Thanks. Um, so I got a question, just repeat it for everybody on the webinar, what's high volume? Let me just zoom back through my slides. Um, so there's a disagreement uh, through some papers, but I think that the biggest ex uh, cited paper is this one by Dr. Sosa. And then she looked at the number of complications that happen. Um, and there's a plateau that once you cross about 25 total thyroidectomies a year, then everybody becomes very homogenous, the, the same. If you can find a thyroid surgeon that does over a hundred, there's some papers that say the very, very tip top will have even a lower risk but then those differences become very, very tiny. Um, and it changes if we're talking about more advanced thyroid operations, neck dissections, clearing the lymph nodes. And so the number for these is actually not very high for complications, seven for central neck dissections, three for lateral neck in the course of one year. So they really just to do some, but there have been studies that showed that, you know, half of all thyroid surgeries are done by surgeons who do one a year. Um, and then, uh, it also has an impact on whether disease comes back. So at the highest volume, uh, they have lower rates of recurrence that I don't think that for thyroid cancer operations, you, you don't need to say how many folliculars have you done? How many medullaries have you done? Um, I do think that that does start to matter for the really rare subtypes like anaplastic, poorly differentiated because then that extends past the surgeon. The care determines on the radiation oncology team, the medical oncology team, how comfortable are they with advanced uh, thyroid cancer, um, but that goes beyond surgeon volume. I think that um, choosing any surgeon for anything is incredibly hard. And, and the residents and I at my program talk all the time, like if I suddenly got appendicitis in a different state, it'd be so scary because there's absolutely very little way to tell who's who. Um, so for thyroid surgery, I'm really glad you had a good outcome and a high volume surgeon. Thanks for your guys' attention.